The nature of the pain was still the same, but the tactics had to be suitable to the immediate conditions. Even though I had used them successfully once before, I could not remedy the new situation by holding on to old investigative techniques. Fresh, innovative techniques were required, ones devised in the heat of battle to deal with present moment conditions. Mindfulness and wisdom went to work anew, and before long the chitta once again converged to the very base of samadhi. During the course of that night, the chitta converged like this three times, but I had to engage in bouts of hand-to-hand -hand combat each time. After the third time, dawn came, bringing to a close that decisive showdown. The chitta emerged bold, exultant, and utterly fearless. Fear of death ceased that night. Painful feelings are just naturally occurring phenomena that constantly fluctuate between mild and severe. As long as we do not make them into a personal burden, they don't have any special meaning for the chitta. In and of itself, pain means nothing, so the chitta remains unaffected. The physical body is also meaningless in and of itself, and it adds no meaning either to feelings or to oneself, unless, of course, the chitta invests it with a specific meaning, gathering in the resultant suffering to burn itself. External conditions are not really responsible for our suffering. Only the chitta can create that. Getting up that morning, I felt indescribably bold and daring. I marveled at the amazing nature of my experience. Nothing comparable had ever happened in my meditation before. The chitta had completely severed its connection with all objects of attention, converging inward with true courage. It had converged into that majestic stillness because of my thorough, painstaking investigations. When it withdrew, it was still full of an audacious courage that knew no fear of death. I now knew the right investigative techniques, so I was certain that I'd have no fear the next time that pain appeared. It would, after all, be pain with just the same characteristics. The physical body would be the same old body, and wisdom would be the same faculty I'd used before. For this reason, I felt openly defiant, without fear of pain or death. Once wisdom had come to realize the true nature of what dies and what does not, death became something quite ordinary. Hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, bones. Reduced to their original elemental form, they are simply the earth element. Since when did the earth element ever die? When they decompose and disintegrate, what do they become? All parts of the body revert to their original properties. The earth and water elements revert to their original properties, as do the wind and fire elements. Nothing is annihilated. Those elements have simply come together to form a lump in which the chitta then takes up residence. The chitta, the great master of delusion, comes in and animates it, and then carries the entire burden by making a self-identity out of it. This is me. This belongs to me. Reserving the whole mass for itself, the chitta accumulates endless amounts of pain and suffering, burning itself with its own false assumptions. The chitta itself is the real culprit, not the lump of physical elements. The body is not some hostile entity whose constant fluctuations threaten our well-being. It is a separate reality that changes naturally according to its own inherent conditions. Only when we make false assumptions about it does it become a burden we must carry. That is precisely why we suffer from bodily pain and discomfort. The physical body does not produce suffering for us. We ourselves produce it. Thus I saw clearly that no external conditions can cause us to suffer. We are the ones who misconceive things, and that misconception creates the blaze of pain that troubles our hearts. I understood clearly that nothing dies. The chitta certainly doesn't die. In fact, it becomes more pronounced. The more fully we investigate the four elements, breaking them down into their original properties, the more distinctly pronounced the chitta appears. So where is death to be found? And what is it that dies? The four elements, earth, water, wind, and fire, they don't die. As for the chitta, how can it die? It becomes more conspicuous, more aware, and more insightful. This essential knowing nature never dies, so why is it so afraid of death? Because it deceives itself. For aeons and aeons it has fooled itself into believing in death when actually nothing ever dies. So when pain arises in the body, we must realize that it is merely feeling and nothing else. Don't define it in personal terms and assume that it is something happening to you. Pains have afflicted your body since the day you were born. The pain that you experienced at the moment you emerged from your mother's womb was excruciating. Only by surviving such torment are human beings born. Pain has been there from the very beginning, and it's not about to reverse course or alter its character. 
Bodily pain always exhibits the same basic characteristics. Having arisen, it remains briefly and then ceases. Arising, remaining briefly, ceasing. That's all there is to it. Investigate painful feelings arising in the body so as to see them clearly for what they are. The body itself is merely a physical form, the physical reality you have known since birth. But when you believe that you are your body, and your body hurts, then you are in pain. Being equated, body, pain, and the awareness that perceives them then converge into one, your painful body. Physical pain arises due to some bodily malfunction. It arises dependent on some aspect of the body, but it is not itself a physical phenomenon. Awareness of both body and feelings is dependent on the chitta, the one who knows them. But when the one who is aware of them knows them falsely, then concern about the physical cause of the pain and its apparent intensity cause emotional pain to arise. Pain not only hurts, but it indicates that there is something wrong with you, your body. Unless you can separate out these three distinct realities, physical pain will always cause emotional distress. The body is merely a physical phenomenon. We can believe whatever we like about it, but that will not alter fundamental principles of truth. Physical existence is one such fundamental truth. Four elemental properties, earth, water, wind, and fire, gather together in a certain configuration to form what is called a person. This physical presence may be identified as a man or a woman and be given a specific name and social status, but essentially it is just the rupa kanta, a physical heap. Lumped together, all the constituent parts form a human body, a distinct physical reality, and each separate part is an integral part of that one fundamental reality. The four elements join together in many different ways. In the human body, we speak of the skin, the flesh, the tendons, the bones, and so forth. But don't be fooled into thinking of them as separate realities simply because they have different names. See them all as one essential reality, the physical heap. As for the heap of feelings, they exist in their own sphere. They are not part of the physical body. The body isn't feeling either. It has no direct part in physical pain. These two kantas, body and feeling, are more prominent than the kantas of memory, thought, and consciousness, which, because they vanish as soon as they arise, are far more difficult to see. Feelings, on the other hand, remain briefly before they vanish. This causes them to stand out, making them easier to isolate during meditation. Focus directly on painful feelings when they arise and strive to understand their true nature. Confront the challenge head-on. Don't try to avoid the pain by focusing your attention elsewhere, and resist any temptation to wish for the pain to go away. The purpose of the investigation must be a search for true understanding. The neutralization of pain is merely a byproduct of the clear understanding of the principles of truth. It cannot be taken as the primary objective. That will only create the conditions for greater emotional stress when the relief one wishes for fails to materialize. Stoic endurance in the face of intense pain will not succeed either, nor will concentrating single-mindedly on pain to the exclusion of the body and the chitta. In order to achieve the proper results, all three factors must be included in the investigation. The investigation must always be direct and purposeful. The Lord Buddha taught us to investigate with the aim of seeing all pain as simply a phenomenon that arises, remains briefly, and then vanishes. Don't become entangled in it. Don't view the pain in personal terms as an inseparable part of who you are, for that runs counter to pain's true nature. It also undermines the techniques used to investigate pain, preventing wisdom from knowing the reality of feelings. Don't create a problem for yourself where none exists. See the truth as it arises in each moment of pain, observing as it remains briefly and vanishes. That's all there is to pain. When you have used mindfulness and wisdom to isolate the painful feeling, turn your attention to the chitta and compare the feeling with the awareness that knows it to see if they really are inseparable. Turn and compare the chitta and the physical body in the same manner. Are they in any way identical? Focus clearly on each one and don't allow your concentration to wander from the specific point you are investigating. Keep it firmly fixed on the one aspect. For instance, focus your full attention on the pain and analyze it until you understand its distinguishing characteristics. Then turn to look at the chitta and strive to see its knowing nature distinctly. Are the two identical? Compare them. Are the feeling and the awareness that knows it one and the same thing? Is there any way to make them so? And the body, does it share similar characteristics with the chitta? Is it like the feeling? Are any of these three similar enough to be lumped together? The body is physical matter. How can it be likened to the chitta? The chitta is a mental phenomenon. 
an awareness that knows. The physical elements that make up the body have no intrinsic awareness. They have no capacity to know. The earth, water, wind, and fire elements know nothing. Only the mental element, the mano dhatu, knows. This being the case, how can the chitta's essential knowing nature and the body's physical elements possibly be equated? They are obviously separate realities. The same principle applies to pain. It has no intrinsic awareness, no capacity to know. Pain is a natural phenomenon that arises in conjunction with the body. But it is unaware of the existence of the body or of itself. Painful feelings depend on the body as their physical basis. Without the body, they could not occur. But they have no physical reality of their own. Sensations that arise in conjunction with the body are interpreted in such a way that they become indistinguishable from the area of the body that is affected. Instinctively, body and pain are equated, so the body itself seems to hurt. We must remedy this instinctive reaction by investigating both the characteristics of pain as a sense phenomenon and the purely physical characteristics of that part of the body where that pain is felt acutely. The objective is to determine clearly whether or not the physical location, say a knee joint, exhibits the distinctive characteristics associated with pain. What kind of shape and posture do they have? Feelings have no shape or posture. They occur simply as an amorphous sensation. The body does have a definite shape, color, and complexion, and these are not changed by the occurrence of physical feelings. It remains just the same as it was before pain arose. The physical substance is in no way altered by pain because pain, being a separate reality, has no direct effect on it. For instance, when a knee hurts or a muscle hurts, knee and muscle are merely bone, ligament, and flesh. They themselves are not pain. Although the two dwell together, they retain their own separate characteristics. The chitta knows both of these things, but, because its awareness is clouded by delusion, it automatically assumes that the pain is mixed in with the bones, ligaments, and muscles that compose a knee joint. By reason of that same fundamental ignorance, the chitta assumes that the body in all of its aspects is an integral part of one's very being, so the pain too becomes bound up with one's sense of being. My knee hurts. I am in pain, but I don't want to suffer pain. I want the pain to go away. This desire to get rid of pain is the kilesa that increases the level of discomfort by turning physical feeling into emotional suffering. The stronger the pain is, the stronger the desire to rid oneself of it becomes, which leads to greater emotional distress. These factors keep feeding each other. Thus, due to our own ignorance, we load ourselves down with dukkha. In order to see pain, body, and chitta as separate realities, we must view each from the proper perspective, a perspective that allows them to float freely instead of coalescing into one. While they are bound together as part of our self-image, there is no independent viewpoint, and therefore no effective means to separate them apart. As long as we insist on regarding pain in personal terms, it will be impossible to breach this impasse. When the khandas and the chitta are merged into one, we have no room to maneuver. But when we investigate them with mindfulness and wisdom, moving back and forth between them, analyzing each and comparing their separate features, we notice definite distinctions among them, and so see their true natures clearly. Each exists on its own as a separate reality. This is a universal principle. As the profound nature of this realization sinks deep into the heart, the pain begins to abate and gradually fades away. At the same time, we realize the fundamental connection between the experience of pain and the self that grasps it. That connection is established from inside the chitta and extends outwardly to include the pain in the body. The actual experience of pain emanates from the chitta and its deep-seated attachment to self, which causes emotional pain to arise in response to physical pain. Fully aware the whole time, we follow the feeling of pain inward to its source. As we focus on it, the pain we are investigating begins to retract, gradually drawing back into the heart. Once we realize unequivocally that it is actually the attachment created by the heart that causes us to experience pain as a personal problem, the pain disappears. It may disappear completely, leaving only the essential knowing nature of the chitta alone on its own. Or the external phenomenon of pain may remain present, but because the emotional attachment has been neutralized, it is no longer experienced as painful. It is a different order of reality from the chitta, and the two do not interact. Since at that moment the chitta has ceased to grasp at pain, all connection has been severed. What's left is the essence of the chitta, its knowing nature, serene and unperturbed amidst the pain of the khandhas.
No matter how severe the pain may be at that time, it will be unable to affect the chitta in any way. Once wisdom realizes clearly that the chitta and the pain are each real, but real in their own separate ways, the two will not impact one another at all. The body is merely a lump of physical matter. The same body that was there when the pain appeared is still there when the pain ceases. Pain does not alter the nature of the body. The body does not affect the nature of the pain. The chitta is the nature that knows that the pain appears, remains briefly, and ceases. But the chitta, the true knowing essence, does not arise and pass away like the body and the feelings do. The chitta's knowing presence is the one stable constant. This being the case, pain, no matter how great, has no impact on the chitta. You can even smile while severe pain is arising. You can smile because the chitta is separate. It constantly knows, but it does not become involved with feelings, so it does not suffer. This level is attained through an intensive application of mindfulness and wisdom. It's a stage where wisdom develops samadhi. And because the chitta has fully investigated all aspects until they are understood thoroughly, the chitta reaches the full extent of samadhi at that time. It converges with a boldness and subtlety so profound as to defy description. This amazing awareness comes from analyzing things completely and exhaustively and then withdrawing from them. Ordinarily, when the chitta relies on the power of samadhi meditation to converge into a calm, concentrated state, it becomes still and quiet. But that samadhi state is not nearly so subtle and profound as the one attained through the power of wisdom. Once mindfulness and wisdom have engaged the kilesas in hand-to-hand -hand combat and triumphed, the nature of the calm that's attained will be spectacular each time. This is the path for those who are practicing meditation so as to penetrate to the truth of the five khandhas, using painful feeling as the primary focus. This practice formed the initial basis for my fearlessness in meditation. I saw with unequivocal clarity that the essential knowing nature of the chitta could never possibly be annihilated. Even if everything else were completely destroyed, the chitta would remain wholly unaffected. I realized this truth with absolute clarity the moment when the chitta's knowing essence stood alone on its own, completely uninvolved with anything whatsoever. There was only that knowing presence, standing out prominently, awesome in its splendor. The chitta lets go of the body, feeling, memory, thought, and consciousness, and enters a pure stillness of its very own, with absolutely no connection to the khandhas. In that moment, the five khandhas do not function in any way at all in relation to the chitta. In other words, the chitta and the khandhas exist independently because they have been completely cut off from one another due to the persistent efforts of meditation. That attainment brings a sense of wonder and amazement that no experience we've ever had could possibly equal. The chitta stays suspended in a serene stillness for a long time before withdrawing to normal consciousness. Having withdrawn, it reconnects with the khandhas as before, but it remains absolutely convinced that the chitta has just attained a state of extraordinary calm, totally cut off from the five khandhas. It knows that it has experienced an extremely amazing spiritual state of being. That certainty will never be erased. Due to that unshakable conviction, which became fixed in my heart as a result of that experience, and therefore could not be brought into doubt by unfounded or unreasonable assertions, I resumed my earlier samadhi meditation in earnest, this time with an added determination and a sense of absorption stemming from the magnetic pull that this certainty has in the heart. The chitta was quick to converge into the calm and concentration of samadhi as before. Although I could not yet release the chitta completely from the infiltration of the five khandhas, I was greatly inspired to make a persistent effort to reach the higher levels of tamma. No matter how deep or continuous, samadhi is not an end in itself. Samadhi does not bring about an end to all suffering. But samadhi does constitute an ideal platform from which to launch an all-out assault on the kilesas that cause all suffering. The profound calm and concentration generated by samadhi form an excellent base for the development of wisdom. The problem is that samadhi is so peaceful and satisfying that the meditator inadvertently becomes addicted to it. This happened to me. For five years I was addicted to the tranquility of samadhi, so much so that I came to believe that this very tranquility was the essence of Nibbana. Only when my teacher, Acharya Man, forced me to confront this misconception, 
was I able to move on to the practice of wisdom. Unless it supports the development of wisdom, samadhi can sidetrack a meditator from the path to the end of all suffering. All meditators who intensify their efforts to develop samadhi should be aware of this pitfall. Samadhi's main function on the path of practice is to support and sustain the development of wisdom. It is well suited to this task because a mind that is calm and concentrated is fully satisfied and does not seek external distractions. Thoughts about sights, sounds, tastes, smells, and tactile sensations no longer impinge upon an awareness that is firmly fixed in samadhi. Calm and concentration are the mind's natural sustenance. Once it becomes satiated with its favorite nourishment, it does not wander off where it strays into idle thinking. It is now fully prepared to undertake the kind of purposeful thinking, investigation, and reflection that constitute the practice of wisdom. If the mind has yet to settle down, if it still hankers after sense impressions, if it still wants to chase after thoughts and emotions, its investigations will never lead to true wisdom. They will lead only to discursive thought, guesswork, and speculation, unfounded interpretations of reality based simply on what has been learned and remembered. Instead of leading to wisdom and the cessation of suffering, such directionless thinking becomes samudaya, the primary cause of suffering. Since its sharp inward focus complements the investigative and contemplative work of wisdom so well, the Lord Buddha taught us to first develop samadhi. A mind that remains undistracted by peripheral thoughts and emotions is able to focus exclusively on whatever arises in its field of awareness and to investigate such phenomena in light of the truth without the interference of guesswork or speculation. This is an important principle. The investigation proceeds smoothly with fluency and skill. This is the nature of genuine wisdom. Investigating, contemplating, and understanding, but never being distracted or misled by conjecture. The practice of wisdom begins with the human body, the grossest and most visible component of our personal identity. The object is to penetrate the reality of its true nature. Is our body what we've always assumed it to be, an integral and desirable part of who we really are? To test this assumption, we must thoroughly investigate the body by mentally deconstructing it into its constituent parts, section by section, piece by piece. We must research the truth about the body with which we are so familiar by viewing it from different angles. Begin with the hair on the head, the hair on the body, the nails, the teeth, and the skin, and move on to the flesh, blood, sinews, and bones. Then dissect the inner organs one by one, until the whole body is completely dismembered, analyze this conglomeration of disparate parts to clearly understand its true nature. If you find it difficult to investigate your own body in this way, begin by mentally dissecting someone else's body. Choose a body external to yourself, for instance, a body of the opposite sex. Visualize each part, each organ of that body as best you can, and ask yourself, which piece is truly attractive? Which part is actually seductive? Place the hair in one pile, the nails and teeth in another. Do the same with the skin, the flesh, the sinews, and the bones. Which pile deserves to be an object of your desire? Examine them closely and answer with total honesty. Strip off the skin and pile it in front of you. Where is the beauty in this mass of tissue, this thin veneer that covers up the meat and entrails? Do those various parts add up to a person? Once the skin is removed, what can we find to admire in the human body? Men and women, they are all the same. Not a shred of beauty can be found in the body of a human being. It is just a bag of flesh and blood and bones that manages to deceive everyone in the world into lusting after it. It is wisdom's duty to expose that deception. Examine the skin carefully. Skin is the great deceiver. Because it wraps up the entire human body, it's the part we always see. But what does it wrap up? It wraps up the animal flesh, the muscles, the fluids, and the fat. It wraps up the skeleton with the tendons and the sinews. It wraps up the liver, the kidneys, the stomach, the intestines, and all the internal organs. No one has ever suggested that the body's innards are desirable things of beauty, worthy of being admired with passion and yearning. Probing deeply, without fear or hesitation, wisdom exposes the plain truth about the body. Don't be fooled by a thin veil of scaly tissue. Peel it off and see what lies underneath. This is the practice of wisdom. In order to really see the truth of this matter for yourself, in a clear and precise way that leaves no room for doubt, you must be very persistent and very diligent. 
Merely doing this meditation practice once or twice or from time to time will not be enough to bring conclusive results. You must approach the practice as if it's your life's work, as though nothing else in the world matters except the analysis you are working on at that moment. Time is not a factor. Place is not a factor. Ease and comfort are not factors. Regardless of how long it takes or how difficult the work proves to be, you must relentlessly stick with body contemplation until all doubt and uncertainty are eliminated. Body contemplation should occupy every breath, every thought, every movement until the mind becomes thoroughly saturated with it. Nothing short of total commitment will bring genuine and direct insight into the truth. When body contemplation is practiced with single-minded intensity, each successive body part becomes a kind of fuel feeding the fires of mindfulness and wisdom. Mindfulness and wisdom then become a conflagration consuming the human body section by section, part by part, as they examine and investigate the truth with a burning intensity. This is what is meant by tapatamma. Focus intently on those body parts that really capture your attention, the ones whose truth feels most obvious to you. Use them as whetstones to sharpen your wisdom. Expose them and tear them apart until their inherently disgusting and repulsive nature becomes apparent. Asapa meditation is insight into the repulsiveness of the human body. This is the body's natural condition. By nature, it is filthy and disgusting. Essentially, the whole body is a living, stinking corpse, a breathing cesspool full of fetid waste. Only a paper-thin covering of skin makes the whole mess look presentable. We are all being deceived by the outer wrapping which conceals the fundamental repulsiveness from view. Merely removing the skin reveals the body's true nature. By comparison to the flesh and internal organs, the skin appears attractive, but examine it more closely. Skin is scaly, creased, and wrinkled. It exudes sweat and grease and offensive odors. We must scrub it daily just to keep it clean. How attractive is that? and the skin is firmly wedded to the underlying flesh and thus inextricably linked to the loathsome interior. The more deeply wisdom probes, the more repulsive the body appears. From the skin on through to the bones, nothing is the least bit pleasing.' 